Howdy, Sampling Science, we're talking about the cell membrane. So the science understanding we're going to look at, we're going to look at how materials move in and out of the cells through the cell membrane. We're going to describe the structure of the cell membrane. We're going to talk about how it's selectively permeable. And we're going to talk about the surface area to volume ratio of cells. So we're going to use an analogy when we're talking about the cell membrane as it's the walls of the house. So some things can get in easily, so air for example. Um, other things you need special structures to get in. Um, so you have doors that let people in. Um, people can't get through the walls without using a door. Um, some things you don't want in your house, so we've got walls that stop them coming in, so rain, for example. Um, some things you need to put a bit of energy to get them in, so like a, a fridge, or you know, if you're trying to get a fridge through the door, that would take energy. And other times you need to get rid of waste, so you need to get rid of your rubbish on rubbish day, for example. So that's the analogy for what the cell membrane does. So membranes enclose cells, so that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. So that means that some substances are allowed to come into the cell, some substances are kicked out of the cell, and you get different concentrations of substances inside compared to outside the cell. Um, in eukaryotic cells, you also have membrane-bound organelles like the mitochondria down here. So here's a mitochondrion. Uh, you've got the outer membrane and you've got this inner membrane. So same purpose there. They're maintaining a different concentration of substances inside the mitochondrion compared to the outside, and that allows them to do their job. So we're going to look at the cell membrane structure to start with. So the structure is called a phospholipid bilayer. So this substance here is a phospholipid. This is just a drawing of what it, uh, it doesn't really look like it, but just a model. Um, it has one end that's hydrophobic, which doesn't like water, and one end that's hydrophilic that does like water. Hydrophilic ends point out towards, so this could be the outside of the cell, this could be the inside of the cell, since there's going to be water either side of that. And the hydrophobic um, ends point towards each other because they're attracted to each other. They both don't like water, so they're attracted to each other. So this is called a phospholipid bilayer. Um, this makes up the majority of the cell membrane. The rest of the structure we say follows what's called the fluid mosaic model. So we've got the phospholipids, but then dotted through the phospholipids are proteins. And these proteins have lots of different jobs. So this is where the mosaic comes from because those are dotted through. So the phospholipid bilayer, and we've got the mosaic. So we call it the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. So just restating, so on uh, these pictures here, we can see the phospholipid bilayer with the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic ends. So the hydrophobic ends point to each other because they're attracted to each other. The hydrophilic ends point out to where the water would be, so outside the cell and inside the cell. And the fluid mosaic model shows the dotted proteins throughout the phospholipid bilayer. So let's talk about the proteins that are embedded in that uh, fluid mosaic. They have a variety of jobs, um, and they all the proteins can be moved around by the cytoskeleton inside the cell. So the cytoskeleton is the framework inside the cell that holds things in place. Um, there's a variety of jobs done by those proteins. We're going to focus on transport, both active and passive. Um, but they can also do signaling as well. So here we have a steroid inter interacting with a receptor on the cell membrane. That leads to a co-receptor to come in and they get joined together and we get the co-receptor and the receptor bits underneath here joining and that starts a signal cascade inside the cell. So that's really, really cool. It's cells' ways of talking to each other. So membranes are selective. Um, what we're talking about there is that they can allow certain substances in and kick other substances out. And they can do that by in a variety of ways, but mainly through using these proteins. So this is an example of a protein channel. So it's a hollow protein that has a hole of a specific size, and that can allow a specific substance to pass through. Um, so water, for example, passes through these protein channels. There's a channel with a width that's just wide enough for water molecules to come through, so water can transport easily from one side of the um, cell membrane to the other. Water normally wouldn't be able to transport too easily because uh, the phospholipid bilayer it has a water-loving end and a non-water-loving end, so getting through between the non-water-loving end is quite difficult. So that's why these channel proteins are handy. Um, some, channel, some proteins act as pumps, so they can pump substances against the concentration gradient into the cell. So that's another way of selecting what's coming in, by pumping in things um, inside the cell from the outside. So that's an example of facilitated diffusion. Um, this is where energy isn't used to transport a substance in. The, uh, the protein changes shape when the substance um, meets the end of the protein. So that doesn't require any energy from the cell, it just requires energy from uh, the environment. So thermal energy from the environment. 
So insulin um, meets its receptor here. The receptor is a protein that changes shape and that kicks some insulin into the cell. Once the insulin's inside the cell, then it can set off a whole heap of um, reactions that leads to the glucose being absorbed into the cell. So this is just an example of that. So this animation is showing a pump. This is called a sodium potassium pump. So sodium ions are being pumped out um, using cell energy in the form of ATP. And potassium ions are being pumped into the cell. So this way sodium is being removed from the cell and potassium is coming in. This is important for how nerves work, for example. So nerves have a sodium potassium pump all along the um, uh, the nerve to exchange the ions and that generates the charge that the um, nerves use. So the next question is why are cells so small? So the reason why cells are so small is because of something called the surface area to volume ratio. So let's do some calculation of surface area to volume ratio. So here we have a uh, single big cell. We can see its size so it's 20 by 20 by 20 centimeters um, and it's just got six surfaces. Here we have um, same volume, so it's still going to be 20 by 20 by 20 in terms of total volume of the um, cell, but it's cut up into lots of little cubes. So now we're going to calculate the surface area to volume ratio for, this, for these two cubes and compare them to each other. So the surface area of this cube is going to be 20 by 20 by 6, so 6 sides each 20 by 20 centimeters. So let's write that down. So we've got uh, 20 by 20 by 6. I can chuck that in my calculator if I'm not good enough to calculate it in my head, and that's 2,400 centimetres squared. Now, the volume is going to be um, 20 by 20 by 20, so length by breadth by height. So 20 by 20 by 20, which is 20 by 20 by 20, 8,000 square centimetre, uh, cubic centimetres, so 8,000 centimetres cubed. Okay, so surface area to volume is uh, 24 to 80. If I just take the first two off of there, so that's going to be uh, 12 to 46 to 23 to 10. Yeah, that makes sense. So 3 to 10. And surface area divided volume, so 3 divided by 10 is 0 0.3. Okay, so that's the surface area to volume ratio. Um, for this cube over here. Now let's have a look at this um, cell over here. So now we need to calculate the total surface area of all of those cubes um, added together. So we've got uh, 5 by 5 by 5 by 5 by 6. So each cube has 5 by 5 and then 6. We need to times that by the total number of cubes which is 64 for this cube. So we get 5 by 5 by 6 by 64. That equals 9600 centimeters squared. So we can already see that that's much larger. Um, the volume is going to be the same as what we had before because it's just going to be the total volume of that cube. So that's going to be 8,000 centimeters cubed. So the surface area to volume ratio is going to be 96 to 80 which is 48 to 40 which is 24 to 20 which is 12 to 10 which is 6 to 5, isn't it? Yeah, 6 to 5. So 6 to 5, so the surface area volume ratio is 6 divided by 5, which is uh, 1.2. I should know that. So we can see that by turning one large cube into 64 small cubes, we increase the surface area significantly, and that increases the surface area to ratio by a factor of, what's that, 4. So this is the reason why cells are quite small. So the reason why cells are small is because um, many small cells have a larger surface area to volume ratio than one large cell would. That means it's easier to exchange materials with the environment. So it's easy to get, say, more oxygen and glucose in and more carbon dioxide and other wastes out. So it's uh, by having la um, la many small cells, you have a larger surface area to volume ratio than fewer large cells and you can exchange more materials with the environment more readily. So today on Flipping Science, we looked at the cell membrane, how it's selective, uh, what its structure is, and the surface area to volume ratio of cells. That's it for Flipping Science today. See ya.